in the Rise of the Superman, you, you use this concept that basically extreme athletes or athletes who are, you know, climbers, boaters, you know, uh, uh, skiers are putting themselves into states or into positions where it's they have to trigger flow, otherwise there's dire consequences. That they, they're, they're, you and I can re totally relate to this. I remember t being really nervous. You know, I, we didn't like the adrenaline dump feeling, but we're really heightened and nervous and pushing off from the rock even though I don't want to go, but then I'm committed and literally everything would just go. I take two breaths, push off from the rock. And now I'm in the middle of the class five rapid and here we go. And, um, you're saying, you're saying that that was a, you use as an allegory because not that we all need to take crazy risks and do backflips off cliffs. You're saying that, boy, this group of people had triggered or figured out how to trigger it every single time because it was life or death. And then that should be sort of allegory for can we all create our own set of triggers? Am I right? Well, what we learned, what we now know, is that flow states have about 17 triggers, maybe around, of around 20. But these are things that bring on more flow, right? Action adventure sports as practices are packed with these flow triggers, right? But it's not just these athletes. And, I, and I'll give you a classic example. So. All of these flow triggers are ways of driving attention into the now. So if you want more flow in your life, pack your life with these flow triggers, right? That's the simple moral of the story. doesn't matter what the scenario is, but let's take high physical consequences, which is the most obvious with the action adventure sport athletes. And as you pointed out, you're right. For them, it's flow or die in a lot of the situations they're in. But here's where things are totally interesting because it turns out while you need to take risk for flow, it doesn't have to be physical risk. You can replace the physical risk with emotional risk, social risk, creative risk. In fact, social risk works so well, and this was your experience in public speaking. The brain cannot actually tell the difference between physical fear and physical risk and social risk and social fear. Same structures processes, process these things, which sounds crazy until you stop and realize that 150, 200, 300 years ago, if you screwed up socially and got banished or exiled, right, it was capital crime, it was capital punishment. Nobody lived apart from the tribe. So the brain learns to process social risk in the same place it processes physical risk. So that means, you know, you may have to drop into a class five river to pull this trigger, but the shy guy just has to raise his hand and speak up at the meeting to pull this trigger. It's entirely relative, and it doesn't have to be physical risk. Now, to kind of jump into the business world a little bit, where I think this becomes really kind of critical is in your, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're working for yourself, in your, if you're running an organization, if you're working in an organization, and you don't have that kind of fail forward, fail frequently, fail often motto, right, that rapid experimentation motto, then you don't have enough, you don't have the conditions to take risks. So not only are you losing all the massive benefits of rapid experimentation, which is sort of a different topic that we can get to if you want, um, but you're denying yourself the easy access to flow and the massively heightened performance that you get as a result. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, Please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple, Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 